Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Lenore von Stein, and this is an episode of The Facts. Another episode in The Facts is that uh, we have fiction and nonfiction, um, music and no music. And this is no music, uh, nonfiction, uh, and it's a discussion. And uh, my guest today, I'm getting to talk to uh, Carol Lang. She's a professor of history at Bronx Community College, in part of the City University of New York system. And um, uh, we're going to talk about reasons for racism. Uh, let me, you know, there is no such thing as race. So it, it, we got right away a, a, a bogus idea. You know, it's like the moon is made of green cheese or something. You know, it's it's not. Um, uh, it, it's. I, I just want to tell this brief story. I was talking to uh, a friend, somebody I know, a colleague, and she's from Georgia. And uh, she said last night, I, I was telling her about this. Often when I tell people I'm going to do this kind of show, I get in silence. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it depends on who you're talking to, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and so um, she, we were talking for a while, and she said, well, you know, those in those small towns where, you know, they don't really, they don't know anything about this, you know? And I was thinking... How is that possible? Everybody knows about this. Everybody, 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 you know. Mm -hmm. They may not acknowledge it. They may, there's a way that they don't know about it, right? It's, it's what, what, can we define racism for this um, discussion? Um, seems self-evident, but. Well, I mean, I guess I would argue that um, racism is, I agree with you that there's no race, there's only one race, and that's the human race. And racism is the idea that there's some sort of scarcity in the world. And then therefore, one group of people who look a certain way, who come from a certain place, should have that amount of whatever exists on the planet in opposition to somebody else who doesn't look the same way, who doesn't come from the same place as they do. And therefore, you have to concoct the idea that this group of people that doesn't look like you, that doesn't, you know, that's come from somewhere else, doesn't deserve what you should have, and therefore somehow or other they're subhuman and not equal, and you have this antagonism between groups of people over the idea that some people should have more and others who are not equal should not have. And it really comes out of the idea that, well, two things, I think. One of them is that there's perceived um, scarcity, that there's not enough for mm -hmm, everybody mm -hmm. to have, to share in the wealth of the planet. And the other thing is, is that there are people who want to maintain the idea that, you know, one race, quote, race is better than the other because they, that small group of people on the top of that race, really acquire all the wealth. And the people in their, quote, corner or race really end up with nothing. And so... When you have racism, you really end up having the majority of the population living in poverty with this small 0.1% of people, you know, making all of the wealth and having all of the money. And so you have, you know, the development of racism in order to maintain the status, the wealth status that exists in, you know, all societies everywhere in the world. You said two things. I mean, I mean, it certainly strikes me that racism is purely an economic tool. I mean, what you know, it's about, and that that seems to be what you're describing. It's about, and and this, and the other thing that you mentioned that I find interesting, this idea, that this perceived scarcity of. Uh, sometimes I, 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 I've said it because I teach too. I was saying to my mm -hmm. students that you know what? What about a time when when power was is free and every, you know every third grader knows how to tap the sun and you don't have to buy this you know a device or even the knowledge. It's really it's we we figured it out you know and it's very hard for people to not impossible by no means but to cop sag to you know that that this is oh that the these these things that are perceived as you know only a few people can have really everybody could have you know it's 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 just a way to control in some way control the environment control you know the um so we 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 got i got i got more questions here um so um so let's talk about the evolution of, uh, of these ideas of racism, of, of that there is such a thing as race, the, so that leads to the idea of racism. Well, let me just step back for a second. Sure. The other thing that I, I think that capitalism is the cause of the maintenance of 
um, racism because you need to have people pitted against each other. And that's exactly where it began. And, um, there was a time where slaves were brought from, enslaved people were brought from Africa. And there were times when indentured servants came from Britain and they came at the same exact time. But the indentured servants who were white came and their lives were like really almost as difficult as the blacks that came from Africa. And, um, but they were allowed to, they pay off their passage to either the plantation owner or whoever got them to come over. Um, and so they had a very hard life and they lived alongside of blacks and slave people and their lives were very similar. And very often blacks and whites ran away together and they ran off often to the native communities in the southern part of the, what became the United States. And so that became a problem for the plantation owner who just wanted to make sure, I mean, that these people ultimately ended up being pitted against each other. There was a very important rebellion in the United States in 1676 called Bacon's Rebellion. And um, that was a point at which Bacon, who was an English plantation owner, had wanted to get more land for himself. And the governor of Virginia sort of made a deal with the Indians that there wasn't going to be any more expropriation because if no, it's not even in our consciousness that other people lived in what became the United States. The whole native population, millions and millions of people were exterminated and using racism also in, as a, an approach to getting rid of the native population. So Bacon opposed the governor and rose up and said, we want more land. But the poor whites and blacks rose up in addition because they wanted land also. And they were fighting together. And so it frightened the, the powers in Virginia so much that these people were fighting together for you know, land and some sort of equality that they began, they put down the rebellion. I mean, ultimately the rebellion was put down and the white authorities, the, you know, the people that ran the, the governorship of the Virginia colony ended up imposing rules and laws that would begin to separate blacks and whites. And given the fact that blacks were more identifiable as because of the color of their skin, more rules and laws began to be imposed on blacks, which is the, sort of really the beginning of slavery in the United States as we understand it, as opposed to, you know, sort of mixed, you know, th attitudes that people had about blacks. And so the, the people that had dark skin were not people that were brought over to be slaves in the first. They, they were brought over to be slaves and sometimes indentured servants. I so they were, it depended on where they came from and where they came from, when they came, who brought them over. You know, there's, if, this is a very long history in the United States. And many of the whites and the blacks, as I said, ran away together. They were having children together. There was inter interracial couples. Um, and this frightened the establishment so much that they began to impose laws that would, you know, be in opposition to miscegenation. And, you know, they started to give some land to the indentured servants and they gave them clothes and they gave them like 50 acres of land and then they gave them guns. So that by 1705, with the, you know, the giving of the musket to the whites, the poor whites, was the establishment of the beginning of racism in the United States because it was whites you know, supporting white, wealthy whites, as opposed to the blacks who ultimately you should be afraid of, you know, who might want to take your land and should be enslaved. So that was really the beginnings of the, you know, the codifying of racism in the United seems States. Seems so easy to, seems so easy to pull off, you know, <laughs> if you, 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 to pit one group of people against another that, you know, your situation is bad, but it could be much worse, right. you know, and you're, 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 you're lucky where you are and work with us to make, keep you in that, in, in this semi catbird seat that you're sitting in. And unfortunately, historically, that's what's happened in the United States. So that it became so much so that it was almost part of the American DNA. So, you know, unfortunately, trade unions and workers associations began to, you know, keep out blacks, who black workers who were freed, 
you know, free people from their institutions. And over time, strikes would always end up losing because there were no, you know, there were blacks who were sometimes used as scabs and sometimes just didn't support, you know, white workers because they offered them nothing. And this was became historically part of the institutions, except for a few, except for like the industrial workers of the world. Um, but even the Socialist Party in incorporated that racist attitude about blacks. And so, you know, it was for white workers that they fought as opposed to for the working class as a whole. Isn't it, it, it I mean, I, I, I'm sure there are many examples all over the earth of this being done because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's quite a nifty little tool here to, uh, to, to get people fighting, you know, fighting with each other right. to stay on top. You right. know, you, 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 uh, schoolyard 101 kind of exactly. tactic, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it, remi it reminded me just then when you were talking about it, it, what, what little I know about what the British did in India in codifying the, this caste system that was in place, but looser, I, as I understand it, than it was when the British made it clearer that this was a, a no-move kind of, you're not going to get out of here and go here. You're not going to move from Dali to something else. Well, the more important thing about the British relationship to the um, to the Indian masses was the fact that there was, there were, before the British came, there was no India. There was people living in their communities, and there were Muslims and Hindus and Sikhs and living together, sometimes harmonious, sometimes not, but there was no real hostility between the different groups. But the in, what the British did was is that when tribalism began to sort of dissipate in India, the British encouraged tribalism between the Hindus and the Muslims and would give the Muslims stuff and then they would give the Hindus some promises and money here and money there, ultimately inculcating this hatred that exists today between Pakistan and India, um, inculcating this hatred between the two groups, so much so that by the time partition happened in 1947, there was so much hatred between the Muslims and the Hindus that two million people were killed, were killed. murdered, burnt alive, raped. And that was all because Winston Churchill said very explicitly, if you know they don't get pitted against each other, they will show the British government the door. So it was a planned, you know, uh, on the part of the British government to pit these two groups together because they needed to have them fighting at the bottom. And also they wanted to make, the, the, the Indians didn't want to be in the war in World War II. And in order to keep India in the war, the, the British had promised, you know, lots of, actually a state, an independent state to the Pakistanis if they would end up supporting the British in World War II when there was a whole big quit Indian mu movement and people wanted to get out of the war. So the Muslim leadership, not the Muslim, you know, just the regular Muslim person on the street, but the Muslim leadership, his name is Muhammad Ali Jinnah, mm -hmm. ended up organizing the uh, Muslim League and supporting the British in their quest to, you know, just stay in the war. So they ended up murdering millions of people and today there's still tremendous animosity between India and Pakistan. This feeling of being uh, one of the things that race both for the for the victims of the oppressed, the, 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 the people who are told that they're lesser because of some whatever. Um, I remember I have some relatives in Ireland. I remember going to Ireland and one of some somebody that I didn't know at all. I don't know where it was some cousin of a cousin of a cousin. Mm -hmm. She whispers into my ear. Now, when you see the when you see a Protestant, you cross the street, and you know, and uh, I'm not going to do that. And yeah. how do you know? And I didn't. And when I got there, I realized that's how you know is because. Uh, uh, in these small towns, everybody knows everybody, you know, right. and there are mm -hmm. two churches and two bars, right. and you know, mm -hmm. or five bars or something, and and uh, that and the and the and the the, the respective uh, clergy in the Catholic and the Protestant uh, spend a certain amount of time keeping these divisions in place, mm -hmm. uh, so that you, you know, it's and the schools are 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 segregated. Well, you know that it's, the Protestants did much better than the Catholics because they were associated with the British. Mm -hmm. And so historically, the Catholics 
you know, were basically out of the loop. They were, when Cromwell went over to Ireland after he had, you know, killed the king, um, he took all the land from the Irish Catholics. He hated, he hated the Catholics, hated the Pope, and distributed that land to, to his buddies in order to have, you know, support in opposition to the Irish Catholic. And, you know, what, what happened in the United States when a lot of those Catholics in the 1840s came to the United States because of the potato famine, I mean, they were allowed to starve. A million Irish were allowed to starve to death. They came to the United States and, um, you know, they were the, the lowest of the low. And they ended up seeing blacks. This is sort of the beginning of the antagonism between these groups. They saw blacks as if they were freed then they would be competing for the same jobs as the Irish had. And given the fact that there was tremendous hatred for the Irish in the United States because they were Catholic mm -hmm. and they were basically kicked out or not allowed to be in the Republican Party, which was the party of liberation, right? That was the party of Lincoln. They were forced to associate with the Democratic Party, which was the party of slave slavery. And so they ended up becoming much more racist in addition to the fact that in, you know, during the Civil War, the um, rich people didn't, all they had to have was $300 to buy a substitute. And many of the substitutes that they bought... What's a substitute? Somebody to fight for you. So they didn't have to go to war because they thought that they were better than everybody else, speaking of better. And so they paid some poor Irish guy $300 who was probably going to get killed in the war to go and fight for him as opposed to him going and fighting for himself. So you have now all these poor Irish who, you know, who are going to be competing with blacks, who are hated because they're Catholic, and now they're going off to war to fight for people who they don't want to necessarily liberate because they're going to be competing for work when those people are liberated. So you have the draft rights in 1863, which caused lots of deaths of, you know, blacks. That's where in New York as well. Yeah, they yeah. burnt down Lower, lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and still it's the same, you know, the, the, AFL, the AFL became established in 18, not, not too long after, 1886, and Samuel Gompers, who was the head of the AFL, he basically organized only white male craft men, and that's it. He left women out, blacks out, immigrants out, everybody else, and so now you have these Jim Crow unions that don't involve most of the workers, and you have most blacks and women and immigrants who are not organized. And now you have, instead of talking about taking over the economy and sharing it, you know, which any communist would do, then he basically said, this is it. This is the best that we can do. We need to get for the better off workers, the better workers, and the hell with everybody else. And, you know, Gomper sold out three-quarters of the American working class or, or more. Then, uh, and a lot of those white workers ended up having their strikes broken because they didn't have any support on the part of other sectors of the working class. So they were alone. I mean, he just, really, if you do things like that, then you basically undermine your own, your own people. And, you know, the... the in the South, where people are the poorest. In fact, I was listening to Al Jazeera yesterday, and it turns out that in the, the southern and southwestern part of the United States, there are 51% of the children live in public schools live in poverty. 51%, mm -hmm. and they're largely in the South, and that's not just blacks, that's whites too. Because, you know, during the period of the Civil War and after, the white races took, took over, and the South, because the, the North, the Republicans in the North allowed them to get back into power, gave the same plantation owners back their plantations, and refused to, to you know, get um, taxes from the wealthy. And so they don't, there was no money for schools, for social services, or anything. So that meant that both black and whites became tenant farmers and basically had no social services. And if you look now, the, the, those are the people that don't have any health care for the most part. And, and those are the people, or, or I mean, the, the South is a particularly dramatic example of it, but who seem to vote continuously against their own interests, their own economic interests, they, you know, against having health care for them, the ordinary people, if those that are voting, the white people, uh, based on 
uh, con this continuing um, varieties, tendrils of racism that 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 uh, that dictate to them what's you know what's good and what's bad, or you know that 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 inform them what's good and what's bad. Uh, at least that's what it seems like. I mean, why would you, if you were poor and white, why would you vote against having health care? I don't think that the, the people are voting against health care. I think you have the, the governors and the legislators. But why do you keep on voting for those governors? Well, you know, a lot of people in the last election, if you look at it, people just didn't vote. I think 40 percent of the American population voted because for the most part, most people believe that it's really twiddle and twiddle -dum. You know, there's no... For me, I don't even vote either because I think that pretending that you can reform a system that's so riddled with not only racism, but, you know, 80 people in the world have the same amount of money as 3.5 billion people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, essentially, most people don't believe in American politics because they know that all these guys are corrupt and most of the people in Congress are millionaires and, you know, they don't have the same interests as the regular working person. And so people generally don't vote, but they don't see any alternatives. They don't see that, you know, you can live without scarcity, that you can live with abundance if everybody participated in, you know, sharing and, you know, you know, working in that economy. And I mean, basically, I think the only way to do that is through having a communist society. I don't think you can have it with capitalism. You're never going to get rid of racism besides everything else, because racism is so important in terms of pitting, you know, people against we, each we other. We really haven't had a communist example of a, of a real, I mean, because we can't have Russia certainly right. chalky block with racism. I, I, I agree. I don't think there's any country in the world that's communist. But, you know, Karl Marx, when he talked about the Civil War, he said to whites, I mean, he wrote of like books and Tribune articles and stuff, he said, there's no way that white people will be free as long as blacks, you know, people in black skin are not. And so he always, you know, talked about the fact that it's important to not only unite, but liberate black people. And a lot of Marxists ended up supporting the North against the South because they understood that slavery not only was wrong, but was backward and had to be eliminated in order to be able to free everybody, ultimately. What were some of the reasons that slavery came to an end, aside from the, I mean, including, not just aside, not aside from, but including the, the moral issues and the ethical issues, but what were some of the other reasons that slavery, that, that the North wanted to end, slave, wanted to end the, you know, the uh, change, which become slave states and the new states that were joining the Union? And what, what, was, what was motivating the Northern businessmen to the extent that they were? It was really the railroads because the railroads were the most important industry in the North, in the United States, and they wanted to move West. And the Southern plantation owners wanted to move West because now if you, like, you know, plant the same crop over and over and over again, it really ruins the soil. Mm -hmm. So the war that the United States had with Mexico in 1846 was really designed to give that to the plantation owners. But now you have the railroads and the spinoff of the railroads is rubber, steel, iron. All of those people gave money to Lincoln's campaign because they wanted to not necessarily eradicate slavery altogether, but eradicate it from the parts of the country that the railroads were going to take over so that, you know, the, the, if the plantation owners had moved west, the railroads wouldn't have made the impact that, and capitalism wouldn't have made the impact that it had made after the, the, the South was defeated. So Lincoln wasn't out to free the slaves. As a matter of fact, he believed in the beginning, in any case, that if you build up enough industry, then that will take care of slavery and that it might take 50 more years. So we would have gone into the 20th century with slaves in the United States, and that was okay with Lincoln, as long as you kept the union together. Because for the union, this way you can send the markets west, you can send you know goods west that you produce in the east, and you can tie the country together. And since the plantation owners were so you know difficult and wanted to maintain their own property and argued basically our property is just as important as yours, 
we're maintaining it, and so they decided that they were going to secede. But the motivation of the North was not to really end slavery per se, but to make sure that the railroad interests were protected. So just so, just so that I, I understand this, the, the, uh, the, the railroad interests were antithetical to the plantation owner's interests, the same land, is that right. what we're talking about? Right. Uh, and, uh, and so that, oh, I didn't know that. And they were given, the railroads were just given millions of acres of land that they had now expropriated from the Indians because the Indians were living there. They took the land away and they gave it to the railroads for free, absolutely for free. So we're, 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 we're about a minute and a half away from where we need to be or where we're going to be. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do two uh, conversations on this subject, and, and uh, I guess we'll move into the 20th century and the 21st century in, uh, in the second conversation. So, the, so the, 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 there's not enough time really right now to talk about Reconstruction and the nightmare of um, Reconstruction and the... Uh, the uh, I remember they had a they had a um, they had an exhibition at the city of New York with postcards from lynchings and uh, we had grandma's chicken and uh, we brought the whole family down we had a high old time you know and, uh, right. Right. Uh, I mean wow uh, uh, they were selling pieces of people's skin Jesus. taking home as mementos so. There's something about human beings. <laughs> well, we're human, you know, and, and uh, uh, really, what a what a what a crowd! What a crowd! What a what a bunch of animals! All right, Carol. Listen, uh, I and thank you very much You're for welcome. appearing and um, and and talking to us now. And we're going to continue this conversation, and all these conversations will be posted online. Uh, as soon as they run uh, in New York City or on Manhattan, Manhattan, all right? So this is Lenore von Stein for The Facts, and um, hope you enjoyed it.